uh, how to work smarter and not harder when it comes to processing data requests at school districts. So I'll start by basically saying that this message is very simple. There are two things that you should be doing to drastically improve this process and make it less of a pain. The first is to organize your data, and I have a particular recommendation that I'll be going over. The second is to use code, and I know that can sound intimidating, but um, the benefits far outweigh the, uh, the cons, and if you're very hesitant, if you or your staff are very hesitant to use code, just simply organizing your data in the way that I recommend is going to take you 75 to 80% of the way there in terms of saving time. And then I'll provide an example of how easy data requests can be when you follow those two principles. So for the first piece, organizing your data, um, you know, often school district data are very complex you get data from a lot of different places you get data from um, education vendors who might be providing you some of the your assessment data uh, you get data from state assessment files um, you might have survey data and often what's happening if you're using these sources with regular frequency you get something like this you get a file for each year or time point for that set of data, like this one's just arbitrarily called ABC assessment data. Uh, you can imagine this being MCA or MAP or ACT or whatever you want to substitute there. You get a file for one year, for another year, for another year. You might get a file for one year, for one term, etc. And you get all of these files. And so the tendency is to leave them this way. And that's a problem because often what's happening is you're getting data requests to look at trends over time um, either across schools or uh, different uh, uh, ethnicity groups or whatever and having to take your having to clean up the data and put it all together every sing single time you get a request is going to be your biggest source of problems it's going to be your biggest source of errors um, and everybody will be frustrated so instead, um, what you should do, and this is what I did, and it was tremendously helpful, is to create a master file for each of these um, sources. So uh, taking the example of this ABC assessment data, you take all of those files, you clean each of them up, make sure they have the same column headings, and then you put all the rows together into one file. And so what you'll notice about this file is that a student with the ID 1 actually is represented multiple times. And that's because you have all of their records for the ABC assessment in this one file. You'll notice that this first file is that student scored a 180 on this math assessment for the ABC math assessment. And that, um, that corresponded to not meeting the state standards. And for the second record, they scored a 186. And you'll notice that in the same year, they have yet more records. And that's because whereas the first two records were for math, the second two were the reading assessments, the first one for fall and the second one for spring. Now, this can seem confusing and weird to look at because it might not look like the sort of files you're, you're accustomed to looking. At, but the, the powerful pieces here that help you incorporate so much data from so uh, much time, uh, from so many time points and subjects, is that you're including columns here that help you differentiate the rows. And this file has a school year column so that you can indicate which school year that record corresponds to. It has a column for school term so you can indicate which term that that record corresponds to if the assessment was taken in the fall. Um, or in the spring. You have the score itself, which is usually the thing that people care the most about. You have a column to differentiate subject. So if the assessment covered math, reading, science, you could indicate all those things in this column. And then you have uh, 
you know, your regular proficiency. So in this file, you basically, the outcomes you usually care about are score and proficiency. But by including these additional columns, you have um, everything you need to know what an individual record represents. This is a huge time savings because now if you want to uh, process data for just uh, the 2017 school year, you can filter for 2017 and you'll have all the students' data. And then you could break those results out by school term and by subject. If you wanted to just look at 2017 fall math scores, well, then you could filter for school year 2017, filter for school term fall, filter for subject math, and so forth. So this is why I say following that first practice of organizing your data is going to be the thing that saves you the most amount of time and headache. So you would have a file like this for the ABC assessment, a file like this for um, a different assessment, an uh, ACT assessment. Um, you might have a file like this for student demographics, if your demographics change over time, um, and you want to change, you want to track that to keep your reports consistent, etc. Now, the second piece um, is, the second principle is using code. And I'll just say that uh, the thing you want to avoid is really processing your data requests or generating your reports through point and click software. Um, one of the things that's, one of the programs that's uh, very popular in education among social scientists is a program called SPSS. Um, it lets people do regressions and create charts and things like that. But most people are accustomed to doing that work using pointing and clicking uh, on buttons. And the problem with that is um, it becomes nearly impossible to repeat all the same actions that you performed last time. And uh, uh, so if you had to recreate your results, uh, it's sort of a dead end. Um, and oftentimes when you're creating a report, there's lots and lots of steps you're taking. So by only using point and click software, you're sort of doomed to fail. Um, and this was one of the things that um, some of my former colleagues uh, discovered. And so when they started using code, uh, they still tell me that uh, they'll never go back now. So um, <clears throat> when it comes to using code, there are uh, there are a few different programs out there. Um, I use R for everything I um, for for all the code that I write, uh, like the letter R. It's free, um, and it has this program called R Studio that makes it easier to interact with R. Um, but it doesn't really matter what kind of code you use. In fact, that program SPSS has the ability to interact with it just through code. And that's okay too. If you want to use that and you want to write code in there, um, the, the basic thing is that it's able to be reproduced and it'll save you time when you have to redo something. So the principles you'll want to follow is, of course, first and foremost, write code. <laughs> Try to write code for as much of the project as possible. Um, from uh, pulling in data, uh, filtering the rows that you care about, uh, selecting just the columns that you care about, um, calculating the averages or percentages. Try to write code for as much as possible because that's one thing you just don't have to remember. Um, and for every piece of code you write, that's another thing you don't have to remember. It'll just run um, when you've written it out and somebody else can take it and run it as well. The other thing is sometimes, depending on which program you're using, the code that you write and how people write code it might come across as a little confusing um, to other people or yourself if you come back and look at it a year later. So you can add comments um, and adding comments is good practice. Now, I should say that um, even without comments, if you wrote your code and it worked before, it'll work again. And that's another beautiful thing about code. But having comments helps other people read. Uh, it's like reading your handwriting, basically. The other thing... <laughs> is of course saving your code. Um, once you've written the code, save it, put it away, uh, put it in a folder. Maybe you organize your folders by the types of data requests you get or the department that asks you for that data request. Um, but once you have that saved, it enables you and other people to redo the work that you've done in the past and helps you, you know, if somebody comes and looks at the report and says, look, these numbers can't be right. I know they're not right because I saw something else. Uh, you know, I saw that the percentage 
of African American students in this school is this, and you're telling me it's this. How did you get that? Well, by looking at your code, you'll be able to answer them within minutes instead of having to track down what you did. Um, and with that, I will go into an example of how smooth everything can be when you follow these principles. So here's an example of these principles in action. So we're going to pretend that we have a grant for the district. And as part of this grant, I'm required to produce a report each year. And I use the program R um, and R Studio to write my code for data requests. And so I made up some data, um, but that but those data adhere to the structure that I suggested. So we have some behavior data that looks like that, historical suspensions in this case. We also have some student demographics. And in this example, there are two questions that, keeping it very simple, there are two questions that I have to answer for this grant report. Uh, one of the questions is, what was the average math score of students by ethnicity over the last five years? Another question is, what does the disproportionality of suspensions look like for each ethnic group um, or ethnicity group of students compared to white students over the last five years? And I have code in here that produces graphs to do this. And the last time I produced it, last year, I looked at the data from 2014 to 2018 to answer both of these questions. And it produced a file that looked like this. This is going to create a Word document. Here it is. And so for this question, it produced this graph with the labels. And again, all of these data are fake. And then for this question, it produced this graph. Now, this is a very simple example, but you could have a 15, 20 page report um, generated in this way. Now, because of following those two principles about organizing data in that particular way and using code, now this year, instead of having to remember how I pulled the data together and aggregated numbers, etc., now I know that I need to update the data, and that's really all I need to do to reflect the most recent years, five years, so from 2015 to 2019. And I'll do that for this graph too. 2019. I'll save that, and then I will generate the report again. And it's done. So all of these data are updated, reflecting from 2015 to 2019. And everything is 100% consistent with how the report was generated last time. So what may have taken several hours to try to recreate and been error prone, now I can just generate within the matter of seconds. So hopefully that example inspired you to follow these two principles of gathering and managing your data in the way that I suggested, as well as using code so that you spend less time processing data requests and you feel confident in those results. Uh, for more helpful information, just visit my blog at blog.parsimonyinc.com or you can visit my website at www.parsimonyinc.com. Thank you.